I can't see it, Katja. Are you sure? Because it doesn't say so on the Zoom. Okay. Ah, okay, so it did. Okay, great. So welcome to our event today on redefining Europe's role after the COVID-19 pandemic, a very big issue and a very broad topic, obviously, but it comes at a very, very interesting moment, um, uh, not only a moment uh, in which gradually uh, European countries end their lockdown measures and escape from uh, the uh, toughest part of the pandemic. Uh, perhaps we will have other tough parts, um, but anyway, I mean, we are improving the situation at the moment still. But it comes really at a moment where um, a lot of minds start to think now about um, the so-called Conference on the Future of Europe. And this Conference on the Future of Europe was supposed to be uh, a pivotal moment where uh, citizens would bring their input uh, into what they expect from the EU and lead to uh, changes of the way the EU operates and um, Europe in general operates. That was the big hope. Um, the, the whole discussion was very much delayed and um, has now um, taken new urgency um, as the Council um, of the European Union published yesterday a paper um, on the Future of Europe conference to give its guidance um, on the future of uh, Europe. Uh, what the Council um, wants to see from this uh, conference is really a series of conferences where all institutions are involved, but also citizens uh, to bring their input and shape uh, the discussion on the future of Europe which would then lead to a report um, in 22 that would be delivered to the European Council. So in other words, to the heads of state and government um, of the uh, EU. Um, this uh, report, um, this will certainly raise some controversies um, and um, the scope um, as the Council sees it of this conference of Euro future Europe uh, on the future of Europe will be limited in the sense that it will not cover treaty changes, it will not cover Article 48 um, uh, of the uh, EU treaties, which allows for uh, ordinary uh, legislative uh, treaty changes or simplified treaty changes. Um, with me today here um, to discuss uh, these issues and what it also means uh, for differentiation uh, in the European Union, so for different countries, uh, different levels of integration, are really three um, renowned experts and uh, deeply involved politicians in the whole matter. Uh, let me first welcome uh, Gabriele Bischoff. Uh, she's a member of the European Parliament and the Vice Chair of the Committee on, the Con on Constitutional Affairs, AFCO, um, and a member of the Working Group on the Future of Europe Conference. Welcome, Gabi. Um, let me also welcome Calypso Nicolaidis. She's a professor of international relations at the University of Oxford um, and, um, of course, a well known uh, scholar of European integration. And last but not least, uh, let me welcome John Eric Fossum, who is a professor um, at Arena at the University of Oslo and who is um, a partner um, on a project um, that Bruegel is engaged with, um, which is called EU3D, which is really a project about differentiation, democracy, and dominance in the European Union. It's a Horizon 2020 funded EU project, and uh, we are co-organizing this event really with EU3D, so with John Eric Fossen, who's leading um, this project. Um, thank you again all for joining. Let me uh, perhaps before giving the floor to, uh, to Gabi um, also say that um, we very much look forward to questions and remarks from the audience. Um, uh, the uh, audience can give their input on um, and uh, then you will be able to ask your Some of the questions to our panelists. 
um, that, uh, so without much further ado, um, again, welcome to all of you. Welcome to our listeners. Um, it's a real honor and pleasure to host this conversation on the future of Europe today, what it means for uh, the constitutional setup, what it means for citizens, but also what it means for countries that are outside of the EU, um, perhaps uh, such as Norway. Uh, I think we will have a great conversation. And uh, let me start, Gabi um, Bischoff. Um, uh, Gabi, you are in the working group in the European Parliament looking at the Future of Europe conference. Um, and I think many in the European Parliament have had really very high expectations of this Future of Europe conference. Um, the Council seems to um, uh, put, uh, put a sort of um, break on this, on the ambitions of this uh, con Future of Europe conference. Um, by saying, well, in the end, we don't want any treaty change and we want only a, re a report to the European Council, which then the European Council will consider in its wisdom. Um, but, you know, basically the, the result is a report. Um, the end result is a report. Am I too harsh um, with uh, my assessment of uh, the Council and what will the European Parliament do? Uh, first of all, uh, I think it's it's very timely that we have the debate today and finally, finally, after six months of talking, discussing, negotiating, the Council agreed on a mandate. So we have now the mandate of the European Parliament with, uh, as you said, an ambitious program for this conference on the future of Europe. And on the other hand, we already have the mandate of the Commission, which was also very timely in January. And now we have the third mandate of the, of the Council mandate. And from now on, negotiations will start between the three institutions on the governance, the organization, and further efforts. So what the Council agreed on yesterday after a long time is not what it will be, but it's what the council wants. And we will see how the concept will be after the negotiation. But I think it's quite obvious that we have some differences um, regarding the governance. But I think, as you said, a key point is that the plan of the European Parliament, and it agreed with broad majority of all political groups, is really to have one conference that lasts for two years and that has different layers. But these layers are all part of this conference. So you would have an institutional level, you would have the citizens' agora on different issues, and you would have the youth agora, and it all together would form the conference. And what at the moment, if you look at the mandate of the council, is they want different events. They want that these events will be in the end summarized by a report. So it's a bit of repetition what we already had two, three years ago. Remember with the uh, proposal of Juncker and the scenarios, the debates that took place and this beautiful report that the European Council drafted and debated and uh, nothing coming out of it. And I think this will be a key point in the end where we'll be um, on what will the three institutions agree in the end? Will it be a meaningful exercise or not? And I always quoted, I'm not surprised about this last paragraph on Article 48. Um, in the council mandate, because they always had this kind of surrealist approach, you know, this Magritte picture, Ceci, Senata, and Peep. Uh, this is not a convention. We have to sort of write it down. Um, and, and it was never intended to be a convention, but an open process. But then it, the important things will be what will follow afterwards and what will be the next step. And if you have an open process and you involve a lot of citizens, civil society, academics, you embark on a process and you will see in the end how much appetite there is also uh, with mm. citizens on treaty changes and on certain changes. And I think the COVID pandemia you referred to shows us sort of in a, in a almost painful way where some deficits are and where we have to improve. 
But Gabi, can I uh, push you a bit more? Because I think everything we said so far is very abstract, right? I mean, for a citizen to understand what we are talking about, I think it's actually very difficult, right? I mean, so 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 first of all, I mean, why why is this topic about changes of the treaties or changes of the way the EU functions uh, on the on the on the agenda in the first place? I mean, you mentioned the pandemic. Now, is it? Is it that the pandemic has taught us major deficiencies in the way um, our institutions operate? I mean, what really is the issue here? Is it democracy? Is it legitimacy? I mean, can, we, can you just give us a bit more of a sense of why the European Parliament thinks so much that there need to be big changes? Um, and then afterwards, we can perhaps unpack a bit what is what is what would be the convention and what would be the way to change treaties if that is necessary? But first, first, why why do we see want to see these changes? I can give you some examples. In the view of the European Parliament, a key objective is to have a European Union that is capable to act. And if uh, and if you look in the in the last years, we can see. For example, if you look at migration and asylum policies, that uh, the citizens in Europe realize that Europe is not capable to act properly together here, it's very divided, the council is blocked since years, um, and, uh, and we are seeing a tragedy developing in the Mediterranean, uh, and nothing, nothing is changing, or the experience in the pandemia is that the immediate reaction uh, was um, a sort of national uh, impulse to close the borders, to not let medical products reach other European countries within a common uh, market we have, uh, and that you cannot address a pandemia only on national level. I think that was very obvious with citizens. And when, when they realized that Europe has almost no competence to address this. Um, many people were surprised about this mm. and to see we will have uh, to face more situations like this and therefore I think the crisis, the pandemic again made it obvious that in certain areas where Europe is not able with the 27 to agree anymore on a common policy that we need certain changes here. And I let me just stress to go back that you, for me, Europe is often a Europe of missed chances. I mean, we had this debate on fighting pandemias in the last convention. We yeah. also had proposals um, how to change it, but we were not able to do so. So, um, so, so I would look at this from a very practical perspective. What are expectations? This will be part of the debates. What are expectations of citizens? What to address? Um, and in which areas they think changes are necessary, what kind of changes, and to feed this into the institutional debate. So in a sense, if, we, if citizens um, want to see change uh, with, the pan, uh, with, with regards to competences on dealing with pandemics and health crises as the way, the way we saw them, uh, that would be a moment where they could voice it and then the European Council could consider it and perhaps even decide that after all it may be necessary to do some treaty changes um, so as to give some competences to the EU level to deal with the pandemic, uh, with future pandemics more effectively. So, so let me turn to, to Calypso. Uh, Calypso, you've been uh, researching and you're also part of the EU 3D uh, research network, which looks at differentiation. And of course, um, health uh, is one interesting dimension where we have complete differentiation in the sense that it's all national competences, um, very little EU competences. But then um, we also have other areas where there is really differentiation between Euro countries, non-Euro countries. There's the countries outside of the EU that are still closely integrated with us. How do you see uh, those aspects of differentiation to be reflected um, in the um, uh, future of Europe conferences? Uh, Guntram, uh, absolutely. Uh, I think that the, uh, this moment demonstrates that the lessons of COVID need to be reflected not just in the minutiae of the conference, but the ethos. 
uh, Gabby, not a pipe, yes, but a pipe dream, I would say. <laughs> and, and I think the pandemic really lay, lays bare the great relevance of our 3D, not just because we all yearn to see each other in 3D and not just in 2D one day, but because, you know, the, I take our slogan in our network to be no differentiation without, with domination and without democracy. Mm -hmm. And if that's the case, you know, what does it mean in terms of just slogans for the conference, for the vision we want to develop? So can I give you three types of differentiation, Gunchkrab, to build on what you just said? And each have their operative word. The first is differentiation as experimentation. After all, COVID, the COVID-19 pedagogy is that we are really facing as societies, you know, this long-term process of collective effort as individuals and collectives to keep experimenting, learning from our mistakes, adjusting. And what is the EU, if not a mega experiment in polycentric governance, you know, in modern history? So for me, the right lesson here is not just that, hey, we need more Europe here, more Europe there, but that we have Europe organizes multiple scales and locus of government governance. That is, we have actually different autonomies, different circles of autonomy. That's the operative word. Starting from household, neighborhoods, regions, you know, even in France, the Girondins who support regional centric approach are winning over the Jacobin Paris Center. Wow. But of course we see this all over the world. So if we ask about, you know, Gabby's capacity to act, I think we really need to distinguish between two different types of role for the EU. Um, one is really as a connector between these different circles of autonomy that can be the nation state and we need to take the sting out of sovereignty. It's right and proper that our states, you know, with different capacities, vulnerabilities, exercising different modes of coercion react differently, but here the EU comes in as hey, good old open method of cooperation, mutual learning, synergies. That's different from an EU role as I would say, not connector, but integrator. Uh, you know, this is, we're back in a big way to the old chestnut of strategic autonomy for the EU. Um, and that's again, you know, uh, something on different fronts that we need to think through. A big thing about COVID is the public versus private that states need to reassert, they are reasserting their power internally, taking over the economy in big ways, but sometimes they need to do it together to, you know, pro in, to procure whether it's PPE or, you know, vis-a-vis -vis Apple and Google tracing app. Why, why are we not together on this? But there is another front. The second front is not public private, but of course it's some version of geostrategic autonomy. Are we in a new cold war? Do we have to really can we be autonomous, not from the US versus China, but from their own zero sum logic? You know, and that's where foreign investment screening and all of all our discussions of, about multilateralism, you know, come in and we'll talk about this. But very quickly, Guntram, that's one type of lesson. But this, this is differentiation as experimentation and autonomy, but differentiation as hierarchy is you know, one of the big bugbears that we had when we created this 3D network. This is what our Norwegian friends have been concerned about all along, the EU's regulatory hegemony, how this model of you converge in exchange for access creates these huge asymmetries of power. Europe is a, this unilateral exporters of rule. Maybe that's okay to be a regulatory hegemon. Maybe that's the kind of biggest, best power we have but our Norwegian trends were unhappy, but swallowed it because they could depoliticize it. With Brexit, we've learned that mm, you can't, not with a country like Britain, and this will have an effect on, on the neighborhood. Um, and this is where the operative word for Europe, the challenge is to organize symmetry. You know, we're talking a lot about symmetry because suddenly we have a symmetric shock and solidarity looks very differently because moral hazard looks very different. You know, maybe those who suffer the most that are actually morally attractive because they keep their grandparents in their house and that's part of their problem. But the point is here that the, the great lesson of Brexit um, is that, you know, Europe needs to think about its externalization of rule in a more symmetric way. And I think it's an interesting twist on what you talked about the 
the big recovery fund, the, pro, the mutualization, beginning of mutualization of debt. Well, that's kind of a new approach to symmetry. Instead of telling each other what to do with our budget, we're going to pool more resources and we can come back to that. And the final point that I wanted to make here in this introduction, Guntram, is differentiation in a third way as regime competition. You know, we're, or, we're having a big discussion about democracies and autocracies, who does best in a COVID world within and outside Europe. And I think that in parallel to that, you know, that statecraft as stagecraft, what we're seeing is that our societies do better as theater of care than theaters of war. Um, and here the operative word really is transparency. Um, because of course, the core cause of the pandemic is obscurity, you know, starting with uh, opaque Chinese bureaucracy and other bureaucracies. And I think that the challenge for the convention is to, is to really demonstrate by example that we can reinvent democracy, first of all, as transparency. And we can say a lot about global transparency, but in Europe today, and this is a question back to Gabby, but I'm, I'm sure John Eric has things to say about this. How do we create a convention, a process that hmm. both itself is transparent and really allows citizens to take over Europe as one of this, of this coalition of citizens call, calls itself these days. I can say more about that, but hmm. also um, demonstrates how the EU in the long term can be a kind of different bubble, not a bubble closed onto itself, but a bubble because everybody can see through it and work with it, including, you know, if we take the great budget debates we're going to have in parallel to the convention, can we imagine participatory budgeting? All of these things are questions of transparency. And at the end of the day, what I'm trying to say, Guntram, is that if we think of all the multifacets of our differentiation, can we have a new philosophy you know, of autonomy, symmetry, and transparency if we're reinventing Europe? Thank you, Calypso. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, and I want to come back to you um, perhaps in a, in a few minutes. But before that, let me, let me try uh, to bring in John, John Eric. Uh, um, uh, John Eric, you just heard Calypso saying, well, hegemony, um, is the EU a hegemon um, and uh, regulatory hegemon? And um, I mean, what, how do you see this, perhaps this particular aspect and how this would play also in this future of Europe conference? I mean, should the future of Europe conference uh, foresee elements of um, differentiation uh, or should um, we accept um, that um, you know, the EU uh, basically, once it decides on health policy, that health policy should basically apply to everyone um, and uh, even to countries that are not in the EU. I mean, just to give a sort of concrete example, I mean, how, how do you see this differentiation versus uh, integration aspect? Thank you very much for also for organizing this, this conference. Uh, as you said, it is an extremely timely debate. Um, on, on the... Um, uh, differentiation it is uh, we have to keep, go back to to the um, way in which sovereignty is configured in in contemporary europe because what we see is that member states pool and share sovereignty in the eu institutions and what is interesting with this is that that of course means that they are engaged in and they have agreed to take on a number of different tasks jointly at the same time when the integration process proceeds this still means that the framework that has been established at the European le level has a significant effect on what states do domestically. So, so the idea of self-rule, this is what we experience in Norway. It is very difficult to, to make any kind of watertight compartment in relation to a, a dynamic entity that you signed on to with a, in a more limited sense. As long as the EU mm -hmm. integrates, you will be more and more in, included in this anyway. So that's the center of gravity. Now, is the solution then to ask the EU to change itself to do this, or should it force a discussion inside of Norway or the other affiliated states to find ways of dealing with this where they can also participate where decisions are being made? I'm sorry, but this one is, to me, fairly straightforward, actually, in the sense that for, for small states that are on, on the periphery of this, particularly when the stakes are so large, and this is where the conference um, and the whole debate and dealing with the pandemic come, come in, because 
it is about the, the, the future of the European political order. It's not only about the EU, but it is exactly what type of, of rules and norms and and what kind of uh, politics is going to be unfolding. And the European Union has also a possibility of being and saying something in relation to the rest of the world in terms of also enforcing a system of rule bind behavior. Uh, and that's one of the things that is at stake. So this has a fairly, uh, to some extent, a unifying element, but it also gives people predictability. Now, of course, that also means it needs to be democratically controlled. And what we see in the EU is that there is a significant expectations capacity gap. Is that people, the EU is now actually so involved in so many issues, and yet it doesn't have capacity beyond regulation. So it is orchestrating and, and um, coordinating state capacities, and therefore there's a lot of diversity in this. However, this does not add up to capacity also in an accountability sense. So people can see mm. where decisions are made and where the buck stops. So it's instead being uh, blended together in, in a f f pretty big mesh. And one of the key culprits in this is the European Council that has shirked away from mm. stating out what kind of system the European Union is supposed to be. This was the case with the uh, European Convention in the early 2000s, and it was guiding the process and it was preventing the development of a constitution by dividing the different provisions of the treaties and so on into a clear constitutional element. And it has since, since then also been developing the institutions so that you have a fairly lopsided union where hard uh, or state core state powers are still very much within the remit of member states, but kind of coordinated by the EU. And then you have a single market that is fairly centralized, with the states also to some extent locked into this. So it's a lopsided kind of system. So this is also one element of differentiation, but it's a kind of bias that's built in. And what we saw with COVID was that the particular competences that were needed to deal with health issues were not them. And people obviously had expectations because the EU was regulating so many other aspects, and yet it mm -hmm. didn't have, as Gabriel was saying, anything on the health aspect. So there is a lopsided element in this. So the, so the question is, can you then develop adequate capacity also to ensure that, that people's expectations in this are being met? Because how can you have mobility and so on if you also don't have a coordinated European health policy? and also mm. a policy in terms of stabilizing the economic situations and so on. And that's that, in that sense, the Franco-German initiative is really interesting. But this is an initiative for the entire EU. It is not a differentiated in, in initiative. It asks all the member states to sign on to this and to be part of it. So this is a de-differentiating initiative in some ways, um, mm. a unifying element, and therefore to push, uh, right. push integration. And this has to do with capacity building. Now, I think in terms of the conference, the... The, the catch here is that uh, there are, I mean, it is important to include citizens, of course. I mean, we're all Democrats, and that's fundamental. The question also is, under what conditions? And if you look at these, for instance, uh, innovative proposals from the Parliament and the Commission about citizens, uh, uh, and new, new hackathons and, and all kinds of things, that's very interesting. And they have had very positive experiments. But this also has to be sluiced into the general working of the political system. And, and if, if this is done, um, but without a clear commitment to having a treaty change, then there will be a lot of ambiguity and people to be able to manipulate that. So if you want to have a treaty change at the end, I think that should come out as a clear commitment. If it doesn't, one should look at the ambitions in relation to this. The other, other comment is, I think, um, the, the, the tension between reforming from strength versus reforming from weakness. It seems to me that the EU at current is very vulnerable and it, it, it doesn't score high on output legitimacy in people's minds. And that to me seems to be a, a problem. So that actually if, that, so this has to do with the timing of the conference when it works. So if the EU actually manages to show that it deals, can deal with the COVID pandemic in a more systemic uh, way and that people can see tangible benefits, then I think that can itself give momentum to the conference and therefore also the push for further uh, reforms. But if the EU starts now and hopes that reforms will be, be coming through through consulting with citizens, this is a fairly high risk game if there isn't a clear commitment to a type of change. And again, I don't trust the European Council in this because it has shirked away from staking out what the EU is supposed to be doing. And the Parliament has okay. consistently been trying to do so. <laughs> right. So thank you. Thank you, John Eric. Of course, I, I'm sure, um, uh, Gabi, you will be very pleased to hear the criticism of the European Council, uh, but uh, because that's a typical 
reaction in the European Parliament. But, but let me just perhaps push you um, on uh, to react on a few points you just heard. I think one, one important point was, uh, I think really this expectation capacity gap. I think that's the way uh, you called it, John Eric, which really means uh, sort of, we are so European and citizens are so much in the EU that they sort of assume the EU is, is in charge, right? And then in the end, it turns out it's not in charge and, and everybody is very disappointed uh, by that. So, so how, how do you solve this with the uh, Future of Europe conference? And the other point that perhaps I want to push you on is, um, is really um, uh, the transparency and the democracy issue. I mean, this, I have to say this whole uh, Future of Europe uh, conference concept looks very opaque to me still. I mean, it's, um, I mean we had these conferences before, um, Okay, I mean, then you never know what it, what is it really a conference? I mean, a conference. There's all kinds of conferences all the time on the, on Europe. So what is different uh, uh, now, and why is that a transparent way of really involving citizens, and why is it legitimate actually, and how does it increase democratic legitimacy? I mean, we have parliaments that are in charge of democratic legitimacy, and if we want a new constitution, we should have a referendum, right? I mean, so I'm. I'm a little bit puzzled by this whole um, democracy transparency aspect and how this this whole exercise is actually going to improve this. So perhaps you can react to those two points. Yeah, first I would like to come back also to see we had the experience in the last European elections that for the first time we really had again a huge increase in participation and the question of democracy played an essential part in it. And the fear that also the European Parliament could be paralyzed or blocked by um, nationalist and anti-European forces. And if you look at the idea as and the concept as the Parliament developed it, and uh, I, I addressed it in the beginning, it is not the expectation that um, the citizens that the citizens have to push for treaty changes, but um, when we when you analyze on one hand the debates of the last years and the involvement of citizens, there was an increase, and it was also um, as it was said by John Eric, an arena where a lot of experiments took place: how to better involve citizens, how to use digital means. Um, to do so, but the problem also very often is that uh, only a small part of society takes part in this kind of debates, and uh, and it's it's mainly the already pro-European um, parts of society, um, and also very often with a high level of education, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. This is also why we said we, we just don't want only more involvement of citizens, but that we want to have these agoras with randomly selected citizens that really reflect the society in Europe we have in terms of not only gender and age, but also in terms of socioeconomic background or education and to have a European dynamic. And I think this is the difference. We would have European citizens. So the Italian plumber will listen to the um, Dutch, um, maybe unemployed woman, um, and also listen to the different realities and develop something together. They will also experience that the situation is very different in the countries and perceived, and that we would make this, this process also very transparent. And we now have new means how we can do it. If you look at the institutional panel in the concept of the parliament, these debates would be streamed and everyone that is interested could listen to these debates in this institutional panel composed of parliamentarians, national and European, the governments, the coalition. And I think transparency will be key. And with this also to raise a broader interest 
uh, engage schools to participate in this event, uh, watching debates, uh, organizing their own events, a civil society in a broad way. So um, this conference for two years, I agree with you that the title Conference on the Future of Europe uh, was and still is a bit irritating because with conference you associate something that lasts maybe two or three days maximum, but not for two years. But to have this process uh, and in the end focus, but focusing it on results. And I think the difference is if I digitally consult citizens in Europe and you never know what happens with your comments, suggestions you did, mm. or if you have feedback loops where um, citizens come up with a proposal they worked on and the institutional panel has to deal with it. They also have to give a feedback what happened to the proposals. Do they mm. land somewhere in the orbit or are they really taken on board? And I think indeed one should not um, overestimate um, overestimate that uh, you will expect a miracle because the situation regarding treaty changes is very clear. There uh, you have uh, in the European Council, you have governments that are in favor of treaty changes and you have yeah. some that don't, but also in the parliament, I think you have a majority, you have a clear uh, yeah. vision also what to change, but there are also forces that don't are uh, very happy about treaty change. But, but Gabi, can I push you on those? Uh, because I'm, yeah. I'm also taking uh, from the audience questions here and Frederic mm -hmm. Lauro asked the question, I mean, what is the point of having a conference on the future of Europe if from the start treaty changes are excluded? And Marco uh, Zecchinelli mm -hmm. um, uh, asks, all goes back to the lack of a real European public debate. Political arenas are still national and the information system gives them what they are used to. So is this conference really going to change anything or is it just sort of a fig leaf um, uh, for creating some sort of a European debate? And after that, Calypso, I want to come to you, but Gabi, if you can quickly react yeah, uh, to those and give the react. EP view. I think it's it's you have to differentiate with, this was never intended to be a formal Article 48 procedure. But for me, this is the prelude to a 48 procedure uh, with this, um, if it's done well. Um, and therefore I still see um, the opportunity here that should be used. Uh, and on the other hand, this was our intention, not again to have limited national arenas for debates. And this citizens agora are European agoras. And this will be very important in the negotiation between the three institutions to keep this aspect that we don't have again decoupled national debates uh, mm. instead of engaging in European debates and creating something like a, a, a European public space for debate. So Calypso, perhaps you can uh, also react to the fragmentation of the debate uh, um, issue. I think that's a very, very interesting point that, uh, and whether such a conference can actually help um, increase debates cross borders. And the other point I would like to push you um, on is um, a question here by, uh, by, uh, by Mr. Anonymous. Um, or Mrs. Anonymous, um, do you expect the, um, uh, the uh, European Court of Justice post COVID-19 as helping reduce the dominance or, or bolstering, uh, demo and bolstering democracy? Uh, insisting on EU law supremacy seems bound to generate conflicts. I mean, should we go for less EU law supremacy and should the European Court of Justice perhaps uh, pull back a bit and be less insistent on uh, 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 on on the European law. Perhaps you can take those two, Calypso. Um, absolutely, and Guntram, uh, everything Gabby says is music to my ears, and I very much hope that her vision of the convention will, will dominate, will be what we get. I mean, I speak as someone who took part in the 2001 free uh, convention, where really the democratic aspect was very perfunctory. 
and there are indeed many lessons to learn. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and I think we should stress that there's been a huge amount of scholarly work since then on what is participatory democracy? How does it work? How does it complement? Because you were worried, Guntram, about parliaments. Well, they, they go together. And there's been all these experiments around Europe in, in, in participatory assemblies, et cetera, that Gabby was alluding to. But what we're seeing, but very often these agoras are very local. Um, and it's not clear to citizens, as you were saying, you know, how we present them. I think the COVID moment is where we are seeing how technology is helping us make these transnational, and including technologies of translation, uh, as it were. And it suggests also that, you know, there is not di bad direct democracy that, yes, there are problems with plebiscite, but their direct voice across borders need to be about, you know, coordinated inputs, dialogues between different countries or locales that communicate with each other. Uh, this would, you know, transnational democracy. So can the convention be a forum for that and demultiply these conversations? And that's where I think we should put in the mix of our conversation, the media, um, incipient European public space. We may be many demoi, but we create these conversations among us. You know, there is this wonderful summer of solidarity that is happening just as we speak, uh, where I think that a lot of participants are trying to do exactly that. So it, it, let's remember the kind of ideal of experimentation. Now that's for the process, your process question, Guntram, but you, you are also asking a, a substance question. You know, what, at the end of the day, what's our vision of, of Europe? And when we say expectation capacity gap, I think we need to remember, this is the supremacy question, that the EU is, is there to increase the capacity of all of the actors within it, states, regions, cities, individuals. It's an empowering mechanism. And sometimes that means centralizing, sometimes not. Um, this is why a bigger budget, you know, is not about doing more at the European level on everything but it's really about, um, a, about distributed intelligence, empowering different bits of Europe to act. And so how the European Court of Justice comes into that, I, we're not gonna rewrite European law. There is something called supremacy. The question is how we interpret it, um, that it is about maybe supremacy in, in, in one area, but it doesn't mean that, for instance, in all of health, suddenly Europe will be supreme. Um, so I think the German court, you know, is very much telling us and giving a challenge to the European Court of Justice to say, you know, how, how is it that we organize our European law as a, as a way of really creating mutual interest, mutual regardingness, other regardingness, as we like to say, in Europe. That's what European law should be about and um, including sometimes sunset clause and all sorts of ways in which citizens who may be worried about, um, who are on the other side, you know, Gabby was saying that all these activists are more pro-European, but really there needs to be, we need to bring everybody back in on the mm -hmm. conversation of this kind of um, um, empowerment vision of Europe. So, so John, Eric, um, uh, let me also bring you in. I mean, of course, there's many points you might want to react to uh, quickly, but uh, let me uh, throw one question to you, which I get from the audience also, which I think is a very pertinent question by Sophia. Uh, she asks um, whether uh, the panel, whether you envisage increased accountability over EU spending in the future especially now that we spend an extra 700 billion via next generation EU. I mean, do we have enough accountability and do we, don't we need more? Well, it's not a straightforward issue like this, but it has to do with how the institutions are configured. Um, I think the EU, generally speaking, is quite uh, accountable in terms of financing. There's quite a, a strict set of mechanisms for this, and I don't think the EU is, is the biggest problem. Now, the question rather is one, in my mind at least, is one of whether you have democratic accountability, and that has to do with the relations among the institutions, and to what extent Parliament and the popularly elected are able to have a significant say in the generation and the allocation of funding. And let me 
just add and bring this uh, in relation to uh, Calypso's point, because one has to be very careful about um, the distinct the distinction between centralization and federalization, and the, this is this is also I think Calypso and I are completely on the same page on this that the fact all issues cannot be dealt with at the European level at, with at a kind of centralization. Rather, it is an important thing to devise a, a clear alliance that say something about who does what. Now, the catch in the European Union is that so much is now blended together, and therefore it is quite difficult. So that has also to do with the broader accountability, um, is that member states are so interwoven with the European Union institutions, it would be better for the European institutions to be somewhat more independent, but also with a lower or, or more limited remit. And therefore, but that means that you have a higher visibility and therefore a, a clearer sense of what the EU is supposed to be doing and what not doing. And that also comes over to, to the court. Again, if in, since there is no overarching script for what the EU is that people have agreed on, each institution is kind of hardwired to push and the European Court of Justice has the obligation to protect and develop European law. And it does so, but not with the same kind of institutional controls that you would have in, in a normal state that had a cl more clearly established constitution with divisions of, of, of uh, competence. So what we get a bit of an irony is that you have over-centralization without this type of pro uh, accountability because there is not a script, script that people have agreed to. So this it seems to me yeah. a kind of a federal irony in, 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 this, in this sense. Uh, the, the other thing I wanted to mention in, uh, for, for the conference is one dimension that I, I think is that it seems that one is relying a lot on participatory democracy to strengthen representative democracy because of the role of the parliament. Now, one dimension that was in the previous convention and also in, in this uh, conference is national parliaments. So actually we have the possibility of activating the parliamentary dimension in Europe in, in general, and that relating to citizens, that can be dynamite. So, I mean, it's not only the European Parliament, but it's actually the parliamentary dimension, that is, the interaction among parliaments in terms of representative democracy, mm. and that makes that work together with participatory mm. democracy. And Jeff, I, was, I was wondering if your questioner on accountability uh, had in mind, for instance, the fact that right after COVID, we've had this rapid reaction on, on budget, giving money uh, under structural funds all over Europe to deal with the, the, the pandemic. But the problem was that some countries, and I won't name them, and in fact, many countries were not accountable, say a city or a, a government uh, about how they spend EU money. Um, and so part of the role of the EU and hopefully to be strengthened by the convention um, or the conference is to be an arbiter or an intervener, not to tell um, local, authorities what to do, but to force them to be accountable to their own citizens when they spend EU money. Mm. Um, and that in turn, you know, means also being accountable, you know, vertically. But the important thing is, uh, as always, for Europe to strengthen local democracy and therefore local accountability. Gabi, can I get, uh, get your reaction really on this? Because I, I think this point really on the money point is, is always getting interesting when, it, when we talk about money, especially when you're an economist. And so, so I mean, let me perhaps give my five cents. I mean, the, the, I think it's absolutely fundamental that we do uh, this EU recovery package. Um, I think it's a welcome, from an economic point of view, an absolutely welcome response that um, the EU goes out there, borrows money, and thereby helps to smooth the shock uh, and helps countries to cope with this massive shock. So as an economist, I'm 100% uh, in favor of this. Now then, I guess my question as a citizen is, um, well, we've seen EU money being wasted before. We've seen EU money not being properly uh, accounted for. We've seen, um, and there's been nice reporting uh, in the New York Times about this, for example, uh, money really going to fund oligarchs, money going to fund big farmers, uh, landowners um, that are connected with the political system. Uh, so we are seeing actually in some areas a lack of proper accountability. And um, in some cases, uh, Calypso, it's even the case that the national political system and the national democracies are perfectly fine because they still vote with 
overwhelming majority for the person that uh, uh, uses uh, the money uh, in a way that we might not enjoy and we might not like. So, so really, what I, is the kind of accountability we need uh, when we spend so much money, much more money? And don't we need uh, at some stage really treaty change so that the parliament really is empowered and has the taxation absolutely. power and really goes in that direction? Absolutely. I mean, on one hand, I also see the recovery package as a big progress in terms of, and it, it seems to be even to create a sort of federalist moment. But on the other hand, I'm very, very worried. If I look at the different funds and I look, for example, on this new one, the Resilience Fund, that will be expanded and connected to the European semester, that has almost the same size as all structural funds together. And this will be done just on sort of technocratic level between, uh, on one hand, the Commission and the member states um, in exchange money, in exchange for reforms without any role of the European Parliament and any democratic accountability. And I think this is something that should not happen. And I think here we need really big changes and we really need a role of the European Parliament and national parliaments in this European semester, because otherwise uh, we are even losing our democratic accountability instead of what we discuss, how can we increase it? And so to see this moment uh, and to address it, and I can see in, in, we are discussing it at the moment in the parliament, in many parties, a lot of concern and also um, a lot of willingness to address it and to change it. And I think this should be something, especially um, if I look at the economic governance, how to, to, how to increase democratic out accountability here. And I mean, these are reforms as uh, Bruegel was very active there. We have all these reports we know what needs to be changed and we don't need to start this debate again, but uh, we need uh, the political will also to do it. And otherwise I, I fear that uh, Europe will be losing out uh, very much with the citizens because this question of who is responsible for what decision that affects my life is essential for citizens. So in and, the end, we uh, need treaty change. Uh, I think uh, we almost seem to converge on this, but there's a question, Calypso, um, which I think I want to throw uh, at you uh, from a person called Donald from Antwerp. Um, he's saying, do you truly believe that the Italian plumber is waiting for an agora and in-depth discussion on the future of Europe? It all sounds nice, but will it work? Um, that's a very practical question. But, uh, but please, uh, since you talked about the, um, the Agora and the uh, debates cross borders, can you say a few words on this? Yes, we, we, we looked at the examples we have on, on national level with this kind of Agoras, and it works. I mean, you can involve the different people, but um, you need to, to invest in it. If you really want it, you don't get this for free. It's not like you announce uh, an internet debate and then people join. Um, but if there is the willingness, yes, I'm convinced it can work. And I mean, for me, with the future of Europe, it's the same with COVID. We are at a point at the moment where we have to decide, do we go back to the old normal or do we embark and use this opportunity on something new, as you say, reinvent the European Union, but go on a new path? And this governance and the structure of the future of Europe uh, will be a bit of a step in the direction that we don't want to do business as usual and just continue like this, but that we want to try out new paths to be able to rebalance Europe again. Cal Calypso, do you want to say a, a few more words about the um, um, the agoras, but perhaps also about um, the Italian the, plumber? The Italian plumber. Um, uh, perhaps another question, I mean, that relates here uh, by a person called Eric Paul. Uh, he says, COVID-19 suddenly changed the way we work, the way we learn, the way we cure, the way we legislate. 
and it pushed us into the 21st century. Don't you think uh, victims deserve Europe to be bold and bolder than just a conference that uh, doesn't come to a strong result and only two reports? Um, I mean, yes, and in, in a way this relates to our Italian plumber because <laughs> I was remembering the Polish plumber and maybe our fresh period did too. And these are two different plumbers, right? The Italian plumber, I think in our questioner's view, is the, the guy who stays, or the women, after all, they're women plumbers, uh, versus the Polish plumber who was a nomad of Europe. And part of what we're remembering today is that Europe, yeah, there is wonderful free movement and all that, but Europe should serve those who stay, those who do their own thing and don't really travel all around. And so the Italian plumber, you know, has at least three identities. You know, one is he's just a, a citizen and he wants to do his jobs in his good infrastructures and all the rest of it. And he's really happy, I guess, sometimes to see the European budget help Italy um, have the kind of infrastructure that helps him do his job. Um, and this is where everything Gabby said and you said, Guntram, about, you know, he might listen to the radio and see that maybe we're be, we're going to be much more transparent about where this money goes. He's also a taxpayer, right? Um, so, and this is where I would go one step further than Gabby and say, hey, why don't we do real, like Brazil, your other places, real participatory budgeting. There are fantastic experiments that involve, yes, parliament, but also other ways, cities, city councils, etc. Uh, and the Italian plumber as a ta taxpayer would love this. But secondly, the Italian plumber, you know, has children. Um, it looks to the next generation. And that's where I think we can spend European money more transparently if we have real benchmarks, if it's clear why we're spending this money. And coming out of the COVID crisis as a green power, we haven't talked enough about this, but this is what our kids really, really care about. And I think the Italian plumber will too. And finally, the Italian plumber, thirdly, is also a dreamer, also has a vision of the world. And this is where this other question about let's be bold, you know, maybe that's the exact point is that the, at home and everywhere else, can we engineer simply a democratic conversation about what Europe can do for the world? And I think at the end of the day, that also will inspire, you know, and in COVID where we see, you know, the problem of Africa and, and all the developing countries, this is gonna be even greater. And, and I think our Italians, French, Latvian and, and Greek plumbers will all very much uh, watch that too, including because that will have a direct impact on migration wave. And they understand that because citizens are super clever. Let's never forget the wisdom of the multitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, indeed. Um, John Eric, you will have, I think, uh, the last word. Time is coming coming to an end, but indeed, we didn't have time to talk much about the climate issues and the role Europe should play on climate. We talked about health, we talked about the budget, the recovery uh, on the content side, not on the um, on the legitimacy side and accountability, but on the content side. One further area of action where I think a lot of citizens really expect. Uh, the EU and Europe to deliver um, and where perhaps the competences are also not sufficient um, is climate policy and health policy. Um, climate policy because good climate policy ultimately needs taxation, carbon taxation and taxation is a national competence. We have an emission trading system but that emission trading system only covers 50% of our emissions. The rest um, is not covered by any EU mechanism. It's covered by national mechanisms so we are not going far enough on this issue and we might actually need uh, more eu action and the citizens certainly when in surveys they often say well i mean climate policy is really one of those things where you know ultimately it's not it's not um, my nation state that's going to solve climate change it's really the eu that 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 should be our actor here but okay i mean this is another big debate we can have but but, and I'm sure it will be part of these conferences of Europe mm -hmm. debates. But, but John Eric, perhaps you can uh, uh, give us a few concluding words and then we have to close, I, I'm afraid, because our one hour is over and um, it's been a fascinating discussion. John Eric. Thanks. Well, one of the uh, interesting aspects of COVID, of course, is that um, uh, experts 
especially on, on health policy and so on, have been significant in many states and politicians at variable degrees have listened to them. I think you can look at the extent to which governments have abided by the expertise in this. Um, of course, experts are not, are not uh, democratically accountable, but they are accountable to the knowledge and expertise. And democracy also needs this type of, of, of expertise and knowledge. And we can see significant uh, differences between states where leaders have abided by so this knowledge and try to exchange this across borders and so on to develop the best possible policies on the basis of knowledge. A similar argument comes in, of course, on the environment or, or sustainability and the green policy that the expertise and the EU has developed a tremendous expertise on this and has staked out a course and has also tried to show how this can manifest itself in concrete actions. So this the broader understanding here is is on and, and of course what it means is that the political conversation is different the uh, i would say manipulative uh, so-called populists who were unconcerned with truth have been they have been um, found out to a large extent and I'm, I'm hoping that this is something that can continue the, the, the problem here is that what is called populist is actually a, a very much a spiteful notion of what populism really was because it was democratic and it had to do with listening to people and getting in touch with people and that's of course we see some we see elements of this now also in what the institutions are doing and we should not underplay this because this interaction is important now what the european union is trying to do is also to bring in the expertise element in it and all the uh, citizens uh, assemblies and so on have have had a, a healthy exchange between this type of expertise and popular discussions and so on and and have shown the the, the necessary uh, building uh, and that people develop uh, views and 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 reflect on their own stances and so on when they are confronted with these types of, of expertise so this is an important element to try to harness right. thank you indeed the role of experts is yet another dimension of all of this but uh, thank you i think this is really a very very important debate that is starting and uh, i think we will all watch very closely what will come out of the various approaches to the conference of europe and what in the end uh, will be the process and what will be then also the substance of this and i think we will uh, really listen very attentively and perhaps even one of us will be as a citizen uh, uh, or as an expert uh, somehow get involved. Um, Gabriele Bischof, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Calypso Nicolaidis, thank you so much for joining us. And John Eric Fossum, you are a co-organizer, but thank you still for uh, joining us. This was a great debate and uh, thank you to our listeners for asking the questions and please uh, go on our website www.brugel.org uh, to, to read about um, many, many of the topics we are discussing here or on the website of EU3D, where we discuss accountability, democracy and legitimacy in a differentiated Europe. Thank you so much to all of you and until Thank next you. time, bye bye.